Hello and welcome to episode two of Podcast The Motion Picture. I am your host, Kim Jimin, and I am joined today by my good friend, Jestro. Hey, everybody. Now, today we're going to be diving again into the rich world that is Star Wars with the 2002 classic episode two, Attack of the Clones. But before we do, I'd like to find out both of our favorite movies from that year. You want to do a countdown style? Well, yeah. Starting with our number five. Number five, Signs by M. Okay. Night Shyamalan, starring Mel Gibson and Joaquin Phoenix. Good choice, good choice. For me, coming in at number five is Gangs of New York. Ooh, that's a good one. Mm-hmm. Uh, my number four is, this is really tough because they're all like kind of even. Mm-hmm. Um, shit. Okay, let's just go with Minority Report by Steven Spielberg. Number f- for you, that's your number four? That's my number four. Believe it or not, my number four is also Minority Report. Dang. Okay, let me see if my number three is your number three. My number three will be The Ring. The Ring, oh. Starring Naomi Watts, directed by Gore Bervinsky. I see, I see. The Ring, okay. Unfortunately for me, The Ring is not very high up on my list. For me, number three is the action epic hero starring Jet Li. Jet Li. Yes. <laughs> That's a good one. Whew. Okay. Um, I'm going to say my number two then is Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings, The Two Towers. There are a lot of two movies that came out in 2002. Yeah. The Two Towers and Episode 2. And and MIB 2. My number two is The Count of Monte Cristo. Whoa. Yeah. Yeah. Who's in that one? That one is starring Jim Caviezel and Guy Pearce. Yeah, okay. All right. And my number one, which should be no surprise to anybody, is Sam Raimi's Masterpiece. Spider-Man. Good choice. Good choice. Nice. My number one, it just, it just captivated my heart and my soul. It's film work and its soundtrack with its simple melodic tones. And that number one is Catch Me If You Can. Oh, with um, uh, Leonardo DiCaprio and Tom Hanks? It was, it was good, man, for me. Like, I just... I enjoyed that. I enjoyed that movie. It was a good. It was a good chase story. And so, with that, let's dive into Star Wars. All right. uh, the the opening of the movie informs us about the divide between the Senate and the movie starts with an attack on uh, Senator Amidala's life. Yeah, that's pretty crazy. Uh, Although I wasn't really shocked by it because the two pilots land and one of them takes his helmet off and the other one doesn't. And then the senator gets bombed and then the other pilot takes her helmet off revealing Natalie Portman. You're like, oh, you almost got me there, George. After that, we're taken into the Jedi Council meeting with Senator Palpatine. At this point, I'm starting to wonder if the Jedi are really bad at finding the Sith. I think so. Senator Amadala points out that she believes it to be Count Dooku who is responsible for the attempt on her life. And Mace Windu's like, oh no, he was once a Jedi, and they don't Jedi don't assassinate anyone. Yeah, like it's almost inconceivable that a Jedi would ever fall from grace. Mm-hmm. But the way they go about doing it is like, shut up, bitch. You don't know what the fuck you're talking about. I felt that in the first movie as well, when Qui-Gon yeah. says, like, I believe it to be a Sith Lord. And they're like, the Sith have been extinct. That's impossible. Like, mm-hmm. uh, okay, I'm not a fucking Padawan. I'm a Jedi Master. <laughs> I'm reporting to you my findings. I think I think the Jedi are just bad judges of character. Yes. Except for whatever reason, Yoda. We'll we'll get to that later. But I I I this movie actually convinced me that maybe even Yoda might be. Um, moving on, we get to them sending in the uh, Dream Team, Obi Wan and Anakin to go set, to go protect Amidala. Yeah, and this is where the film really starts to pick up for me. Tell me if you remember this as clearly as I do. Like, I had to make note of this 
But there's a one point where Anakin, I don't know what Anakin says to Obi-Wan, but Obi-Wan laughs. And he doesn't, his mouth does not smile at all. He's just like, <laughs> oh, no, I didn't. I missed you. <laughs> and you know, I'm going to say this up front before we really start to get into this. Mm-hmm. But on, a, on the rewatch of this, I don't think uh, Hayden Christensen is as bad as everyone has recalled him being. Looking at it objectively, based on the complaints we hear today, it's the same complaints you get about Kylo Ren, like, oh, he's just being like emotional and impulsive. It's like, yeah, that's that's the Sith, guys. Yeah, <laughs> I agree. And I, I mean, I do think it's very heavy-handed, but I think mm-hmm. that's the writing. I don't think that's Hayden Christensen's performance. In Anakin's defense, I don't think there's no way to like not go dark side when you meet your crush and she goes, oh, well, you'll always be that little boy I met on Tatooine, yeah, Annie. Yeah, that, that cut through. I don't care what <laughs> galaxy you're from. That's got to hurt. At this point, in the comics, it, it, you know, the comic uh, Obi-Wan and Anakin takes place in between episodes one and two. And in it, you basically see that uh, Anakin's just kind of questioning whether or not he wants to be in the Jedi Order or not. All right, and Obi Wan consults with Yoda, and basically tells him that he thinks Anakin wants to leave. And Yoda is basically like, "Yo, if Anakin leaves, and you want to continue to try and guide him, then you have to leave the Jedi Order as well. <clears throat> like because only the Jedi are allowed Jedi teaching. You can't be guided by a Jedi Master and not be a Jedi." Right. There was one interesting line that I wrote down from the comic that sort of made sense as to the sort of feelings that Anakin might be going through without the throughout the series. In regards to even like joining the Jedi Order, he said, I saw a magic man with a sword made out of light and a starship. I was a slave on a world made of dust. What was I going to say? No? Yeah, man. When you put it in perspective like that, of course. Going back to the movie, Anakin and Obi-Wan get in a discussion about how best to protect Amidala. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And Anakin wants to sort of investigate this assassination attempt, whereas Obi-Wan's like, hey, the council told us to defend her. And Anakin, Anakin is an example of a proactive Jedi, whereas Obi-Wan is more reactive. Which is interesting because in episode one, Obi-Wan was more proactive. I find it interesting that the shift in uh, in position. So then what happens next? The assassin tries again by putting some poisonous slugs in, in her room. Those things look and, good. But like, I also want to ask, like, how sentient are these fucking slugs? They, they hide hid from, from R2. They know how to hide and who to poison. Like, what hope do we have against these slugs? Yeah, they, they're pretty creepy. And they, however they did the effect for them, it still holds up. And I loved I loved what followed. Anakin comes in, pops him up like a badass. Oh, and boy. Obi-Wan just runs in and jumps out the window. Which is ridiculous, <laughs> just, but great. And just grabs that robot. And I was just like, yeah! This whole, like the next 30 minutes of the movie are gold, in my opinion. Like this chase scene, you know, they they try for some comedy, some witty banter between the two Jedi, and I don't hate it. I love that when Anakin jumps out of the vehicle, Obi-Wan says that, oh, I hate it when he does this. So that means, like, Anakin on more than one occasion has just driven Obi-Wan somewhere and then just jumped out. No, it's more than at least once. It's at, it's two or more, because if it were the first time, he might have just been like, again? Yeah. When you say, I hate it when he does this, like, it's not <laughs> shocking anymore. It's just annoying. And what do you think uh, Obi-Wan drank at the bar? You think it was like a virgin daiquiri? Or you think it was like a something strong? Well, I just want to know how, how Obi-Wan parties. I think he probably doesn't drink, so it would probably be something like a virgin daiquiri. Yeah, because he, he definitely uh, didn't want the death sticks. He made that guy rethink his life for even offering them. Yeah, Obi-Wan's not one of these, uh, I only smoke when I drink kind of people. So then after that, when they're in the alleyway and they're talk- they interrogate the, the changeling mm-hmm. or whatever it's called, so they get very little information from her. When Boba Fett's dad shoots her with a poison dart. Yeah, Jango Fett 
Well, and I like I like what happens next because they go they go report to the council, and the council's like, "Hey guys, you should investigate the attempted assassination plot." And I was like, "That's what Anakin wanted to do in the first fucking place." I uh, know they're garbage. They are garbage. And, and then Obi Wan's response to this is. What about Amidala's protection? I was like, wait a minute. Shouldn't this be the other way around? Shouldn't Anakin be asking that shit? Obi-Wan's kind of slow sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Or or he had a crush. Like, I, I was entertaining that theory for a little while. Like I've, that. Heard, I've heard a fan theory about that. And it makes what happens in episode three a bit more believable. That there's a a romance going between Obi-Wan and... Padme. So yeah, maybe. And then we have a whole montage of just Anakin and Padme together. Traveling, talking about... Yeah. Dude, almost every scene, he's like a creep in that scene. When she's packing and she's wearing her Princess Leia headgear, he's like just bitching about Obi-Wan and like... Yeah, well, I like... I'm I like... real powerful, but he's afraid of me. Yeah, and I love that he's throwing a temper tantrum, and he's acting like a kid. And then after that, he's just like, I've grown up, though. And he like, tries to seduce her. And it's like, dude, you were, not 30 seconds ago, you were acting like a 10-year-old child. Yeah, and I love that she basically says something like, don't say shit like that to me, it makes me uncomfortable. I was like, good, fucking put him in his place. I do really like Obi-Wan's little detective. I was curious about what library he was in. Like, if he was in, like, a Jedi Council library, or was it the Republic library? Because I feel like in either of those cases, what that lady said just made me feel like she was a fucking idiot. Yeah, she, well, she is. Because she was just like, if it doesn't exist in our records, it doesn't exist. You guys live in space. You guys are literally uh, discovering I mean, I mean, new to, planets. To be fair, we also live in space, Ben. Well, yeah, yeah. But, I mean, you know <laughs> what I mean? Like, we, we wouldn't say, like, oh, we know everything about space. I know, space is a pretty big place, lady. Some might even call it infinite. And, and I then I that. like how Obi-Wan goes to Yoda for help, and then... And some fucking five-year-old tells him? Yeah. And the kid's <laughs> answer isn't even that clever, it's just, someone erased it. And I'm like, isn't that the first thing you should think of? Oh, this isn't in the records. Maybe someone erased it. Yeah, it just goes to Obi-Wan's logic. It wasn't... Hey, maybe that alien guy I visited gave me some shitty info. It was just straight to, oh, maybe it doesn't exist. <laughs> Are you fucking kidding me? I love what happens next because uh, this is the part where Yoda lost my respect a little bit. Because Yoda discovers that the traces of Kamino, that planet, you know, that Obi-Wan's trying to get to, yeah, were the water erased planet. by a, a Jedi. And... Not just earlier, Padme was talking about someone who she thought was trying to assassinate her. And they're like, no, he was a Jedi. He couldn't possibly do that. Who was And it? then Yoda finds out that there's a Jedi who erased the records of Kamino. He's like, who could possibly do this? And he's like, I'm going to meditate on it. And I'm just like, are you kidding me? Yeah. Christopher Lee as Count Dooku is a great choice, but also quite ominous. But yeah, that goes back to what you're saying. The Jedi are not good at investigate investigative work. Like, mm -hmm. let's just compare them to the two greatest fictional detectives, Sherlock Holmes and, and Batman. Batman. Dude, <laughs> this fucking mystery would have been solved in, like, fucking two minutes if either <laughs> yeah. of them did it. They would have met with Chancellor Palpatine and would have been like, you're the Emperor. If they just saw a transmission from both of them, I'm like... <laughs> Done. I just dislike that Mace Windu is just like, nope, Jedi, they can't fall from grace. But that's also why, it's spoiler alert, guys, that's why the Jedi get wiped out. Uh, so, yeah, between all of this very riveting detective work, which I'm, I'm knocking it right now, but I did enjoy it while I was watching mm -hmm. it. The whole romance between Padme and Amadala, er, uh, Padme and Amadala, Padme and Anakin... <laughs> <laughs> like it had it it had a lot of a darker tone upon this like watch through because there's just one part like I don't know if you caught this but there's one part where Anakin just advocated dictatorship yeah like she's like did. you're describing a dictatorship and then they like start rolling around kissing I'm like no he never said no I know <laughs> he just I, laughed I did, <laughs> I did catch that and you know what I've had discussions with other adults you can differ on things like that so he should have just been like yeah I, I do 
Not like it. <laughs> then they fucking surfboard on this fucking dinosaur thing. It's tough mm-hmm. to watch those some of those uh, romantic scenes. I think yeah. everything, like all the romance up until when they go to Tatooine is like really cringeworthy. He really seems like a guy who's just going to fucking snap at any minute. You know, I liked the design of those really tall aliens, but they were a little weird looking. Uh, what'd you think about that uh, Obi-Wan Jango Fett fight? I love that bit where Obi-Wan force pulled his lightsaber to him and then Jango grabbed him and pulled him away from it and then bounced off his hand. It was just a creative style of fighting. Then what happens after that? Oh, that's when uh, Anakin's having nightmares and, and Padme goes like, to oh, Tatooine. You, yeah. you had a nightmare. And he's like, Jedi don't have nightmares. So he goes back to Tatooine. He sees his, his old buddy uh, Watto, mm-hmm. who looks uh, old and grizzled now. I really mm-hmm. hate that everybody calls him Annie. It's just Why? annoying that every character calls him Annie. Like, I don't remember Watto ever calling him that in the first movie. I don't know if I would call somebody I haven't seen in 10 years by a nickname. I think I'd call them first and last name. Yeah, but then they go to Anakin's stepfather's house. Yeah, we're introduced to Owen and Baru, who we know will later become... Uh... Pivotal characters in episode four. And we learned that Shmi Skywalker um, has been taken by Tusken Raiders. Well, like of all the people the, yeah, on Tatooine the to have taken, they took Anakin Skywalker's mother. Yeah, so when I was growing up, my father's favorite football team are the Oakland Raiders. So when I was first watching Star Wars... It was all about the Tusken Raiders, you know? So when they had a comeback, I got all excited. Oh, yeah, the Tusken Raiders. And I thought it was really neat that they showed a child Tusken Raider because it shows that they also have like some kind of family dynamic to their society. And it makes what Anakin does sinister, I guess. Because if they had just showed a bunch of... like generic male looking Tusken Raiders that we've seen in every other movie. Like when he's like talking about, I killed them. I killed them all women yeah. and children. I killed yeah. them. Like he, sh- they show that they're women and children there. And yeah. Like, this guy's fucking nuts. At this point, it, it really becomes clear that Anakin is filled with some suppressed rage. If he had just had an outlet and the Jedi way hadn't just been, forcing him to push it down yeah this story may have gone a different way so after this to a, another desert planet which was tripping me out at yeah first. They, they go to rescue obi-wan on geonosis and they immediately land into a conveyor belt type situation and at this point i i couldn't help thinking myself that um you know padme amidala on this conveyor belt, you know, she would be amazing at platformer games. Yeah. Because she had the most amazing timing and coordination. She and sure like, did. I, like, it would have taken me at least, like, 16 lives if I were playing that as a video game to get yeah. through that particular set of And she did obstacles. it with one. Anakin had the Force, and he just cut through that shit. Yeah, exactly. And he has some Jedi reflex, I can see the future precognition, spidey sense thing. The most amazing person at Star Wars is Padme. Yeah. Or R2-D2. <laughs> yeah, Padme and R2. <laughs> yeah, you know, I liked the action scenes with the humans. Mm-hmm. As soon as C-3PO like fell into the conveyor belt and got rearranged, I was just like, you lost me. Yeah, it felt... I didn't think C-3PO needed to be in the whole film. I would have been perfectly fine with them meeting him in Tatooine. And then leaving him on the on the fucking starship. The only thing I I think I remember R two doing on um, why did he push C three PO out? C three PO is just standing there. Yeah, and it's like oh that was close, and then he pushes him again. Yeah, and he's like ah! and then R two just floats around and saves Padme, and then the only other purpose he serves in the movie is to reattach C-3PO's body to his or his head to his body maybe we're reading this all wrong C-3PO's translating maybe he's just translating wrong and R2's just trying to murder him 
<laughs> and we think they're the best of friends because C-3PO just keeps translating it that way. But yeah, that's the real reason why he went silent in Episode Seven. It's because <laughs> he's stuck with C-3PO. So yeah, then the action scene plays out longer, and they end up in some Coliseum. Very easily take down two giant monsters. Two or three giant monsters. Also at this point, in terms of the big story, you sort of realize that Senator Palpatine slash Darth Sidious slash the Emperor's like big plan was to have his apprentice Count Dooku organize these guys into making a droid army so that on the other side the Republic would be forced to use the clone army. Yeah, that took me a little bit to figure out because I was like, aren't the stormtroopers evil? Why are they hanging out with Yoda? And then I was like, oh. So, but then very boring, to me at least, action scene with a bunch of Jedi. They're just kind of like standing there blocking blaster things and not actually doing any combat. So to me, it was kind of boring. And then they cut to Christopher Lee like standing on a ledge like he does in another great film that came out that year, Lord of the Rings and the Two Towers. He's just like standing on, on uh, balconies talking to people. Basically saying, yo, Mace Windu, you fought really well, but your ass is dead, motherfucker. <laughs> and then the fight scene goes on for even longer. Yeah. When uh, Yoda shows up and says my favorite line in the movie, a perimeter around them you should make, or some shit like that. Yeah. <laughs> ah. I was like... Oh. And then there's some cool explosions when when they attack those uh, big-ass circular spaceships. Then they're chasing Christopher Lee, Count Dooku, on his fucking hover bike. And uh, fucking Padme falls out of the, the hovercraft and Anakin starts throwing a fit. We have to come back! And Obi-Wan, who previously did not want to investigate the assassination plot and wanted to protect Amidala, is like, nah, leave her. She could be dead, but let's go find out who tried to kill her. <laughs> and then the best scene in the movie happens. It's slightly preceded by a very underwhelming lightsaber yeah. battle. But then yeah. it's immediately followed by one of the greatest moments in cinema history. Count Dooku's about to dip when little ass Yoda waddles in and you're like, oh man, he's as good as gone. Mm. And then Yoda fucking just opens his lightsaber and every I remember watching this in theaters. Mm -hmm. Everybody was quiet and like holding their breath because they're like, what? what are we about to see? And then Yoda starts fucking jumping and spinning around like a little frog. And I remember everybody just being like, like some people laughed. Other people were just speechless. Dude, it's so good. I don't care. Yeah. People say. It's an I amazing it. fight. I love it. After the fight, which, uh, so he doesn't defeat Dooku. Dooku fucking drops like a big ass, a bunch of rocks on the Obi-Wan and Anakin, forcing Yoda to, to grab them with the force. And then Dooku uh, uh, flees like a little coward. And then Yoda goes back to hobbling around on his little cane. Then we, we see shots of the, you know, the clone army being prepared by the Republic and rolled out to start policing the universe under, you know, one intergalactic law. Meanwhile, you see Anakin uh, marrying Padme. A private arrangement. Mm -hmm. With his best man, 3PO. It could be that R2 was his best man and C-3PO just showed up. Yeah, that's what I was just going to say. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Is there anything else in the comics about Anakin and Padme's romance? In between episodes two and three are like the entire series of Clone Wars. There's six seasons. On their website, they released like a viewing order of the six seasons. Yeah, so, and I guess uh, there's also a Darth Maul comic that takes place in between... Episodes two and three. Ooh, I want to check that out. Because that's where he gets his robot legs, right? So what'd you think of the film overall? I enjoyed it. I had enjoyed it when I was younger. And so I don't know if nostalgia played a factor. 
Yeah, I agree. I, I actually like it more than Phantom Menace. Yeah, I was actually bit, like really compelled during the whole investigation detective little part of it. I started to lose interest in the, when the Clone War began. All right, so I've got a question. Which Star Wars alien race would you want as a friend or lover? Well, I'm trying to think of the races I know. Because there are some races, like another, the only other race name that came to mind were the Mandalorians, and they're just pretty much humans as well. <laughs> That's what uh, Jango Fett is, a Mandalorian. They just seem like humans, right? Yeah, they're just humans. They're humans with Australian accents. <laughs> it's all of the Oceania regions just have their own planet. Well, like all the Imperials are British. Um, I would pick, I'd want to be friends with a Jawa. I think I'd like, I'd like to just roll with a Jawa because they, fuck, every time they talk, it just cracks me up. <laughs> <laughs> Podcast. The motion picture. Podcast. 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 Presented by Ad. Yeah. Pedro, Dreamspray.